and welcome to Barn Blog. And if you are surprised by the number of people that you're seeing today, don't be. Um, there are five members here of the project um, of the subset of theoretical practice, practice collective. Uh, we will call it STP from here on out, but I didn't want to shorten it in the beginning because STP means a lot of things. Um, and we're going to be talking about the intersection of a whole lot of different ideas and how they are applied to politics. But I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves because there's so many of them. Um, we're going to start with Gabriel. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us all here uh, and for accommodating like this crowd of people. Uh, I think part of the, 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 the reason why it's good for us to be like in large numbers in places is because collectives pretty much uh, trying to use every opportunity we get with other groups, other people to talk about what we do uh, to also kind of rearrange and coordinate amongst ourselves how we see what we're doing because there's so many people coming from so many different places getting a chance to kind of hear the echo of how we present these things also kind of helps us synchronize a bit what we're actually, you know, how we see what we do. Uh, my particular approach to all of this, I've been involved with the STP since the beginning. Uh, I'm, you know, I know this is a bit of a heretic thing to be here. I'm a psychoanalyst and professionally. Uh, and, uh, but that's not that relevant, I guess, to what we do. Uh, the STP, uh, started uh, as a sort of theoretical branch of a political collective in Brazil. It was the kind of, that's why it's called a subset. It was a subset of something, which was this other thing, which had even worse name, which is the Circle of Studies of Idea and Ideology, uh, which is an even longer name. Uh, Does it sound and... better in, Bra in Brazilian Portuguese? Man, no, it, it, Círculo de Estudos da Ideia e da Ideologia. Sounds, no, it sounds... doesn't sound better. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the joke we had is that we, you can trust, we, we won't be trying to uh, opportunistically kind of uh, capture political instruments because nobody's able to chant the name of our collective anywhere. So you're, it's, it's bulletproof in that sense. Uh, so I was part of that other collective and as other people here were as well. And uh, well, that collective dissolved in 2020. We felt like it's kind of, usefulness politically in that context has kind of, had kind of exhausted itself. But the internal group inside of it that was working on the theoretical kind of aspects of what had been done for a decade in that larger group uh, continued to work and gain a bit more of autonomy, started getting involved with other movements, other uh, political trajectories. And uh, so we kind of continued that work. I was part of it. But then it got entangled with the history of many different uh, movements and in Brazil and outside of Brazil, which I think it's also why it's hard to tell the story only with that kind of linear movement from this particular group, the circle of studies, blah, 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 into the STP. But it kind of mixes with these other things that kind of make up what it is today. Uh, yeah, but that's pretty much how I came to it. I came to it by being part of the original organization where it was created and then sticking to it once the organization was dissolved. Yeah, I have a similar story. I was also a JP here, but thank you for having us. Uh, I was also part of the CSII, so, uh, and of the STP as a subset of the circle. So also very similar story to Gabriel. Uh, I think the other people have more different stories about how they get, uh, how they got involved in the STP than, than mine, uh, which is uh, basically the same as Gabriel, but basically, right? So. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's a good point about you, Carol. I don't think you should skip over it, which is like, I came from party politics in Brazil oh, and yeah. so on. You came from a very different political scene in a way, right? I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I skipped that because, yeah, I'm professionally a teacher of philosophy at the university. But I am I'm also a musician. I was a musician at the time, and I was kind of involved in the you know underground uh, noise punk scene and all of that. So this was a kind of important formative experience regarding organizational issues, which is something that we were discussing 
previous to this interview, that is something that you, uh, we, we could say that it's something that unifies almost everybody that, you know, uh, strive and, and uh, thrive in the, in the STP, the people who, who stay in the, in the STP. Usually they are the, the people who are, you know, uh, have more experience or a little bit of experience at least with uh, concrete organization, not just, you know, theoretical work. So this is where I, I came from, like, you know, uh, dealing with a lot of, you know, collectives that uh, had this relationship to music, but as we all know, like uh, these kinds of collective of underground music, they have also kind of political, uh, certain kind of political kinds of, in the plural, right? Kinds of political allegiance that, you know, kind of uh, also inform the way we organize, we organize labels, we organize concerts and all that. So this was also part of the scene and the, dis the ongoing discussions about how, how the ethics of organizing something uh, was uh, also important to me. And on the philosophy side, I was also studying not psychoanalysis, but uh, more like uh, uh, Wilfred Sellers' philosophy uh, that dealt with, you know, uh, philosophy of language and these kind of things. And particularly the problem of normativity, which was quite important to me. So this was also something that was very appealing in the CSII. That was a kind of a collective that uh, the, the, the objective of the collective in a certain sense was kind of the objective, but there's a kind of a method going on that which was had to do with suspending, you know, the concrete uh, beliefs of its members and trying to understand how the collective itself unfolds following a certain set of rules that we can tinker with, change, and all that. So this was a very interesting to me from both sides, from the, you know the punk punk anarchy side of you know in a certain sense uh, a certain concrete study of organization, right? And in the other sense, in the, from the other side, uh, a, a certain kind of application of a certain philosophical, from in my perspective, a philosophical thinking about. Uh, normativity, what does it mean to follow rules and all that. So this was, I think maybe that that's my theoretical take and my particular way of my particular entry into the CSII and then I just continued uh, through the SCP as well. Oh, Wilfred Sellers is a flashback to undergrad that I wasn't expecting to have today. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, Anna? Hey, I'm Anna. I'm the only person here not from Brazil. Um, so I have a fairly different, but also in some ways kind of similar background story, um, which is that like I kind of came out of like, I'm, I'm from Philly in the US and um, kind of came out of like the Philly like DIY sort of music scene. And there was a lot of like, um, you know, political consciousness development in that context, like feminist, anarchist, communist, all sorts of stuff. And I got involved with various organizations sort of coming out of that social group like many years back. Um, this is the second group called SCP that I'm part of. Previously, I was part of a group called Serve the People here. Um, and um, I also have a organizing experience going back a while with a group called Philly Socialists. Um, but um, yeah, and I mean, I, I am very into philosophy. Like I, I'm taking some courses with JP now. And like I, you know, um, <laughs> kind of caught the Althusserian Marxism bug um, at a philosophy course many years ago that never really went away. And I ended up um, finding um, finding STP sort of indirectly through just like studying um, a lot of the contemporary scholarship on that and getting really excited about what some of the people were writing and essays and everything. And so I reached out. Uh, yeah, disclosure, Anna is the only person here I've actually met. Um, and I believe we met at a conference and I said a bunch of slanderous things about Altusarian Marxism, which I have a tendency to do. Um, uh, all right, let's move on. Gordon Psychoanalysis, some Altusar, like we're off to a great start. Yeah. <laughs> Enemy I'm, camp. I'm wondering <laughs> how, how it can like contribute to this, to this mess, but I'm sure I'll get there. Uh, but first to start, like, thanks for having us here. Um, I'm Rafael. I, I'm a, I did a pretty, I think, uh, traditional path in philosophy uh, in the same university that uh, Caron teaches. Uh, 
and then like I did the whole like French continental philosophy thing, Deleuze, Foucault, those kinds of people. And then after I finished like graduate school, my PhD, I got involved in a, first in a, a Marxist reading group with Gabriel and some other friends where some bugs started to being put into my head. And later on, uh, we worked together in one of the spinoffs of CSII, which was the IOE, which is the Institute, or in, in English, I think IOS, Institute of Other Studies, which was, I think, my first uh, experience in organizing and dealing more concretely with politics. We were a collective that was dedicated to dealing with the problem of precarity of students and researchers because, well, from 2016, the coup that we had in Brazil, uh, uh, educational policy became too restricted. We, we didn't have funding. We didn't have options. And our goal was to think of ways and strategies to make to allow people to study, to get access to money and not simply say to them that they have a mission or so on, but actually try and structure materially uh, the possibility of continuing their researches in Brazil, especially considering that, like, from, I think, 2010, 2012, Brazil really, really had a change in, in the composition of the universities because it was in a very aristocratic places. Uh, high middle class people were the, were the ones who, who went there and universities are free, but they were attended mostly by those kinds of people. And then when after Lula, universities became more popular, but after the coup, the structure that allowed more people to uh, join and to imagine a sort of life from that point, it, it started disappearing. So we started working on the Institute of Other Studies. Uh, and it was a very frustrating experience as all types of organizing tend to be at least to a level, but not without also some joy in the process. And uh, the way I got into STP was actually very uh, self-centered in a way I could say, because uh, being friends with, with Gabriel and Caron, uh, I knew it was going on and I always wanted to join. But the, the time that I got to join and that I think it really matched was when we were working on some ideas for the Atlas. And I actually started thinking through my experience in iOS. So the STP, I think it's it's something that, at least for me, it makes sense and it explains the collective. It's a place where uh, the, the attempt to formalize those experiences, however small, however not far reaching, it gave them a sense of reality when we got to see the impasses, got to see what were the problems and made the situations more intelligible. So in a sense, I think this is what brought me to this place. And lastly, Fernanda. Okay, hey guys, um, thank you for having us here. Um, so I think my background's a little bit different from the other fellows from Brazil. Uh, I studied law, I went to law school, and as I was in law school, uh, I participated in a, a local organization that focused on legal aid for occupations and like uh, was focused on urban, uh, urban corporations, etc. And that was my first uh, organized experience. And later on, later on, I finished law school, etc. So I uh, was thinking about going to ph philosophy on the on the graduate school. So I started to uh, study Badiou, and I got really into his concepts. And Rafael, that is my friend. <laughs> he told me to join the SCP that there was a lot of things that perhaps would make sense for me and that was true. I find very interesting the the way SCP um, focus on the research uh, like a collective and there is a space for your own research and also we are building something collectively. So I think that's really interesting and what got me to 
to join and I'm still figuring out like how do my research matches the main project, etc. So that's it. So when I started uh, doing my own research to, to get into what you guys do, I hit a, um, a kind of maybe overabundance of interests uh, that are both uh, related and also opposed simultaneously. I tend to be skeptical of autosaria Marxism. I, I have been slowly worn won over that Lacan is not nonsense. Um, but that took about 10 years. Okay, good. I mean, as long as other people admit that maybe parts of it are nonsense, usually we have ground to go on. Um, and then I also saw that you guys would do some research and uh, Bogdanov and technology, uh, which I am interested in because I'm interested in Marxist cybernetics and cybernetic theory and organization. Uh, I'm also interested in normativity, how historically normativity is constructed. Um, and uh, I like early Badu, although there are times where I would accuse him of being a red platonist. So there is so much here. Let's kind of start from the practice end about what you're dealing with um, and why this is you know, a useful project, because all of you seem to come out of both the intellectual and the actual organizational um issues. And, and one of the things that is often thrown at people who deal a lot in theory is that we don't have anything to say or do as a, prax, as a practice in, in intervening in actual organizations. Um, so I'm going to let you guys respond to that. What kind of, why was such a kind of uh, reorientation necessary in the context of Brazil? And then we can talk about the context of Philly too. You guys mind if I just pick up on something that Rafael said that I think it's relevant mm -hmm. to that? Uh, because, you know, it's funny that Rafael mentioned the educational situation in Brazil. I think it's very kind of good to exemplify the sort of thing that motivates, I think, the work we do. I'm not sure if you guys agree with this fully, but I mean, it's, at least for me, it's, it's quite central. Because, you know, I, we were in this collective in Brazil trying to come up with mutual aid uh, strategies to help students with no funding uh, get money from people who needed like pedagogical help. So the students would help each other to kind of and make the money circulate amongst them. They would get to fund their, their studies a bit more. But that problem is not really, the source of it is not really the coup in Bolsonaro. That source is actually the good news that came before. Because the university was, uh, kind of expanded and more people got to go to it. You don't get to have good news without collateral effects. And I mean, that's not in itself a bad thing, but it's good to know, right? That increased equality also means increase of new problems you didn't have to deal with before. If you change the situation, you have new problems. How, how can that not be the case, right? And a lot of the problems that we had to deal with had to do with expectations of uh, young students that expectations that were built by the leftist government not by the right-wing government that was cutting funding it was built by the previous government and that's usually what made them depressed not the real situation was the expectation that that thing wouldn't happen they didn't prepare for it uh things like this so uh this idea i think that when you organize uh and and when you're producing large scales even situations that create some form of uh, interesting development that this still creates collateral problems that creating a space where people who never meet suddenly meet. So to create a, a collective that does manage to, you know, get workers together with students, whatever you, you, you feel it's a measure of heterogeneity. Well, you're going to produce problems. You're not just going to produce solutions and you should have a theory for the problems you create when you solve something and not just the problems that are created because you didn't solve something, right? So problems that are, let's say, intrinsic to organizing in a certain sense and to reorganizing bits of the world. So I have the impression that if you look at a lot of the shared history uh, of people in the collective, usually it's not just having political experience, but having interest in problems that 
you can't really put them on the account of, well, everyone was ideologically manipulated to, to self-sabotage. Yeah, but I mean, issues of how do you scale things up, how to deal with complex processes, like these things are structural problems of organizing. They are not just, let's say, some bad omen sent by the bourgeoisie to destroy your, your beautiful project. They are things, <laughs> if you want to change things, that's the type of problem you want. That's not a unwanted side effect. That's the very thing you should be desiring to grapple with, right? So I have the impression that there is also a common uh, interest in this sort of thing uh, amongst people, even which is interesting because that's the sort of problem that does cut across very different ideological positions or strategies. Like you might be organizing in the punk scene. You might be organizing in legal aid groups. You might be organizing students university. You might be organizing in Philly with a different idea, organizing as I was you know, in, a, in party politics in Brazil. The fact that organizing itself creates problems and you should be interested in those problems. You should be able to name them. You should have means to deal with them, right? Uh, that's some, something of a tra transversal kind of line to all these ideological especially because all of them are kind of bad at it anyway, right? So that's why I think it's not a problem at all if you have, you know, if you dislike a particular ideological makeup that we bring here or that some of us might be, because we really don't have like a good solid theoretical unit in terms of influences. It's quite, quite uh, all over the place. What I think it's common is that that kind of intuition, you know, so if I could also jump in here, I want to apologize for saying the dreaded words, Althusserian Marxism. I think that in, in this case, it's really more of a genealogical thing in terms of like, like where I came from and sort of how like my thinking about theory developed. And like, I mean, also just in terms of a, a lot of the philosophy that we work with, like how it's sort of theory historically developed. But for me, as well as I think a lot of other people here, it's not so much about continuing a certain pre-existing theoretical project as much as also thinking through the very real like practical and historical limits of that project, like why it has failed to the extent that it's failed, what it has accomplished in spite of those failures and also partially because of those failures and vice versa, like Gabriel was saying. Like, I mean, it's definitely been my experience with organizing. I, I think there is a, cer a certain stereotype, like I've encountered this a lot in the organized left or even in like the online left, you could say that people who have a lot of engagement with theory, it's because they're not organizing very much or they're, they're sort of like holding back from doing concrete practical organizing or whatever. But I mean, I, I, my engagement with politics started out very much directly wanting to like do stuff on the ground and like change my circumstances and like address like the social problems that were <laughs> really bad all over the place where I come from. And um, I got so interested in theory largely because I realized that I didn't <laughs> didn't know what to do. Like, I mean, even when things started to go well, like Gabriel was saying, like, it's like, you know, it's not easy to solve difficult social problems unless you have good ways of thinking through and talking about them. And not just in terms of like single sort of traditions of thought, but also in ways of connecting people's different ways of thinking about things. And for me, one of the most important aspects that like SDP has been focused on is like thinking about how these different kinds of political struggles compose with each other and what kinds of languages and approaches can be used to help them compose better and maintain a certain degree of difference rather than trying to like, I guess, collapse them all into the banner of a single tendency or name or whatever, so. Yeah, I think uh, this this that Anna said Anna said it, it really explains. I think also, if I look at like for example, I was saying that I was going I think on a pretty pretty pretty, pretty traditional path. I did my my undergrad, my my dissertation, my PhD in in philosophy, but in the middle of the way, and this was all like po uh, this was all possible as Gabriel said because we had a big change in Brazil where. A new, a new promise of expectation was available for for a new type of life that was not uh, so 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 something. It was not. A, it was simply not an option for most people. And in the middle of this, I mean, I was going to be like one of those terrible Conti Deleuzians who talks out about like philosophy of nature and what is a rhizome and a body without organs. I mean, if you look at my dissertation, it's like it's it's there, it's there. 
a bit but, worse than death in many ways. Yeah, um. yeah. I know, I know I would be able to contribute. Even if, I mean, I'm just going to put on a parenthesis. You said that Baju's bad because he's a red Platonist. Come on, that's, <laughs> that, that's the good part. It's because I saw the light and I became a Platonist the last year. So I just had to interject that. But as I was, as I was saying, uh, in the middle of this path, I mean, it, there was like an abyss, like there were no more opportunities. And it dawned on not only me, but also my colleagues, that there was something that like we, we set straight on and it's like a 10 year path. It's not something that you like change lanes so easily uh, doing a dissertation, a PhD in philosophy. It doesn't have, give you many job opportunities, at least here in Brazil. Uh, but uh, it started, it got us thinking like, okay, so we are doing this, we are studying bodies without organs or like epistems or whatever, whatever is your cup of tea. And, and we look at like the teachers, people who were in a more established position, they were going head on, there were no problems. They had the spaces in the, in, in, in journal, in, in newspapers, they were in the public sphere, they could get money if even if the university system collapsed, there was a place. And when we looked at our path, even like in basic education, high school, uh, we were going in the wrong direction. Philosophy was being taken out of the curriculum. So it, it appeared as a problem and we had all these uh, tools and you try and make sense of those things with your tools. And then I think it's a very... It's a very it's a very interesting experience that I think unites the group, which is not like theory is not an explainer in the sense that you begin with theory and then it translates practice into something that is intelligible. It's you are in the sense like you are thrown in media res, uh, and then theory is like what you do after you reach certain impasses. Of course, you are dealing with theory. You may be dealing with theory. You're not going to stumble if you're just like involved in practice. But at least in my sense, it, it starts to gain another meaning after some specific struggles. So it, it does have that effect, I think, of making things clearer. And as, as I think Anna said, which is like it's fundamental, even if I'm a Platonist, I'm, I cannot, cannot, will never leave that path. Uh, I do, th and because Platonism is the truth, of course. But because, in a sense, it's not a matter of doctrines. There's of some debate. That sounded what? There's some debate about that within the yeah. group. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Mm -hmm. of course. Uh, <laughs> the light, the light will shine someday. But like I said, uh, there's no. It's not a. It's not a, a matter of doctrines of like, oh, we have a body without or with without organs, and now we can interpret things. And that, I, I think, is what gives the multiplicity that of questions, of issues, but also of references. Because the references, they are useful as long as they light the problems, the matter at hand that we've been facing and, and, and the, the, from the struggles that we have. Um, I would like just to add something uh, to the, uh, like this this difference between practice and theoretical, theoretical work that uh, I came from like a really practical background uh, like this. Dealing with uh, legal problems and the things that we, are, we see in law school, uh, there is like, uh, at least in Brazil, there is almost uh, zero focus to theory of law. Like mm -hmm. there is a different um, field. This is it, like it's uh, true in America. It's true in the United States too. Yeah, it's like we focus on the process and litigation, and not on the theory of law and philosophy of law. This is like okay, you need to go to a philosophy uh, school to uh, look through those things. But I think that it was important to me to uh, first is uh, be in this. Um, um, oh my God! I say this in English like. Environment. Environment, yes. <laughs> environment. In this environment of uh, really practical problems and like this litigation problems and facing things that are really harsh. Like you're dealing with 
someone's uh someone will lose their house or someone will uh go to jail jail for something that they didn't do so you're dealing with things that are really harsh and trying to think about uh another possible uh, legal um theory to approach normativity and what is possible to the normative um, rules of a state to do for someone. Like there is a limit to what a capitalist state can do. So that was like my entry for getting interesting in what STP is doing as theory, because I think you, you are framing things as Politics is not a matter of science, I, I, like directly, it can be mixed with, but I, I really liked something that is on the crisis and critique test. I can, it's really on, on the, in the beginning of the text that well, think politics in its own terms. And I think that's really nice. There is a, there is a nice uh, thing to start, like nice place to start. And I think that uh, theory of law would be something different if if there was more this approach and i think there's there's a uh, theoretical and practice are not that far away as sometimes we sometimes we think i think that's something that is uh, common through the, the whole group and <laughs> uh yeah and this is like it's really good that you mentioned this because we have this whole tradition here in Brazil of, of anthropologists who are intermixed with law. They're like lawyers who end up studying anthropology, where the development of theory is like a side effect, but an important one, of their attempt to deal with, for example, matters of territory and invasion of indigenous territory here in Brazil. So I think that it, it's exactly this kind of... Uh, uh, nexus that that interests us especially because it's not theory as a means of simply we we don't when we deal with collectives or when we deal with our personal experience it's not a matter of simply uh, using theory to explain away uh the uh, issues like oh this is this is like simply a matter of of you not uh i don't know i don't know ideology now liberalism we could use whatever mm -hmm whatever words you enjoy. But there is a matter of, of like theory. It seems like a really good tool to allow yourself to uncouple yourself also from certain commitments, doctrinal commitments that you might have that allow you to engage with other discursive practice. So in a sense, I think there is a, a, a side effect which is very interesting uh, and which is connected to our interest, not only as a, theory collective, but also as a collective which, which is, wishes to engage with other collectives, which is the, the fact that while we are working through our theoretical questions, our theoretical issues, we are also not going to simply direct other, uh, direct, uh, talk to other collectives as if we were like theory heads that are explaining things for them. I think it's very similar to, but in a different uh, instance to what Gabriel said about uh, psychoanalysis, the distance between practical psychoanalysis, being a pra 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 practitioner, a clinician, and, and also seeing psychoanalysis in everything. You get to, to understand where the development of theory fits, where it's useful. And I think that uh, this allows us to even talk to more people in the end, I think, in the long run. So, um, just a note of, of interest, I am also someone who trained for law in philosophy and anthropology, and that's actually kind of rare, and it's interesting to know that it's common in Brazil. It was an accident on my part. Um, I ended up getting an English degree, because that was a better <laughs> route to a job. But, um, nonetheless, I, I think there's a lot that resonates with me in this idea of collective thinking and bringing different disciplines through a theoretical pra practice. Um, one of the things that, you know, when I went through the materials Gabriel sent me, I was actually like, okay, wow, like I have to deal with this, 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 and this, but it's actually really good because one of the things that we see 
I think we see is is what you guys called axiomatic strategy or like, you know, this idea of the like platonic form of the perfect program. And I'm going to start poking you to get a response on Platonism. But um, uh, are uh, in any of these things that we assume will work because they've either worked in the past or someone that we respect and we modeled our politics off of, held them, et cetera, as kind of ways that we, as kind of unstated norms that we try to impose on any given situation. And often what I've seen, and you know, I, I've dealt with both the theoretical and the practical side of a lot of this myself is that success and this hit each other and then melt and collapse. I don't know how else to explain it, but you, you see people who, who as soon as they have success and conditions change, they cannot adjust any kind of strategic thinking or even what they think a program would be because of these sort of priors that they cannot let go. Um, and that's really hard to organize people around. Um, uh, so what are the kinds of things that, what are the kinds of walls that you guys have hit because I, I got the feeling when I read your your basic premises of research document that axiomatic strategy was a problem that almost everybody had encountered. Uh, can, can I just say something about that? Just because, uh, just to clarify something, because I think that it's our fault. We use it in a very weird way in that document. I mean, since then we, because it's so confusing, we've dropped the reference almost altogether. I mean, there are people who in the group like Reza, who's not here, but I'm sure he'll be, be watching later, that, who loves this term very much. But it, it was perhaps too indebted to the way that, you know, red Platonists use this expression, <laughs> which is to oppose exactly what you call the perfect program, mm -hmm. right? Because for nerds in these formal worlds, uh, usually they make the opposition between like a definitional thing, which is where you formulate the content of something and you need to stick to that content it becomes like an ideal it's more a definitional thing whereas the and you have an intentional so to speak definition of the concept you want you describe it right we should go this way this is where we want to get mm -hmm. axiomatic approach tends to be actually weirdly the pragmatic one because how do you know which axiom you want you know by the consequences it produces if it doesn't produce interesting consequences or if the consequences are inconsistent you need to drop it you cannot keep it so that's not a common way of approaching it. And removing that ambiguity, I think we're nevertheless totally on board, it's my impression, at least with what you said. If you, if you, if you, even if you dissociate axiomatic from this idea of like, you set in motion something with kind of a de definite content that you usually take from a model that pre believed to have been previously useful. And then if you build based on this, the the cost of changing course afterwards, either the personal or kind of just even organizational, because sometimes you only get things into motion because everyone is coordinating through that little model, which while it's, you know, pretty much inefficient because they're small thing, you're not doing anything and you think you're learning, you can pretend. The moment that things become a bit bigger, pretending is very costly, but there is no other mechanism of coordination. And then you're kind of fucked. Mm -hmm. and, so I think that this sort of problem is that you mentioned is goes straight into the direction of the things we're dealing with. Just that I think that document has this ambiguous formulation because we, for absolutely nerdy reasons, uh, oppose axiomatics to clear planning. But I mean, that's secondary, you know? I uh, am remembering that Baduian language is being used here. And thus yeah, I'm axiom... so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to apologize. Uh, uh, this axiom is used in a very specific way that is related to the way it's used in analytical uh, philosophy, but not exactly the same. It's, uh, yeah. I think of it actually, and I'm going to get even nerdier in a different way, um, in a way I hate because I hate when cybernetics theorists use the numbers. But when we talk about like, system five or ethos stuff in cybernetics and technology that's what you're dealing with and and yeah i mean that makes sense that you would oppose it that way but uh 
I would also say trying to explain that to people is going to be who aren't inundated in tradition is real hard. Um, but uh, so, but the perfect program, I mean, there, there's all kinds of perfect programs. Um, and I, you know, I am old. I know I don't look old, but uh, I, I am. And um, I've kind of lived through a couple of things in the North American left that I don't know if they parallel exactly the same way in Brazil. Um, and I'm going to be interested in that. Where we came out of the 1990s with a total opposition to programmatic politics. Um, and somewhere between... Uh, 1998 and 2012 we flipped and became about nothing but programmatic politics um but with no agreement on how to even establish what a program would be um which is like 90 percent of the debates on what little bit of the u.s left has any relevance right now um what is the experience in Brazil around those orientations? Was it largely programmatic? Was this a hostile to programmatism? Where, where, where were you guys at when you approached this? That's a complicated question, man. Yeah, it is. I'm also pondering. Like, uh, I'm, I mean, I think you, we can identify the, the tendencies that you point to, but I'm not sure they are in the same periodization. Right? Okay. Like, Think. I'm not sure. I wouldn't say they are not, but I'm not sure about that. I think we have like a very strong anti-programmaticism tendency still today going on, like since 2013, like the you know the, the movement of 2013. And uh, there is kind of uh, for some people things get to tend to get uh, put uh, like uh, programmaticism against spontaneity, like in that sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this builds well into uh, Gabriel's last response because uh, I think what we are interested in, in a certain sense, is not in coming up with a plan or a program, but in coming up with vocabulary. And the vocabulary is something that makes you see stuff. So this is this is something that I'm not sure everybody here gets, but I get this a lot. This accusation: Oh, you're a Leninist or whatever you want to control the, the spontaneity of the masses, whatever coming from, you know, uh, uh, a kind of a milieu that is, uh, I, I'd say, uh, more on the spontaneity side than the programmatic side, for instance, coming from aesthetics, from music, from all that. So uh, I'm kind of a black sheep in that because I'm all for organizing in a much more conscious way, but uh, not in a predetermined, like you have mm -hmm. a program, step by, stepwise program, determined in advance of what you're doing, not, not in that way. And this is why I also talk about vocabulary, because I think of vocabulary, you, you get like this uh, toolkit that makes you see stuff. And if you check the STP text there, I would say that this description fits them, them very well. Like, what if, right, right? You, you, we use these, these concepts to, to read the situation. But uh, the, those texts, uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to derive a concrete program from those texts. They are much more about making us see the social worlds we are embedded in. And for that, you need theory. But you see, there uh, you can also flip a certain relationship between theory and practice, which is part of your first question, because we're not theorizing to put it in practice afterwards, but we are theorizing what is happening, trying to uh, trying to tinker with the situation and extract from the situation the vocabulary that, that would yield more intelligibility within that social world we are enmeshed in and, and acting upon. So I'd say this is much more, I'd say we are much more, uh, yeah, that, 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 that catchy phrase that everybody liked the uh, other day, like we are in the business of fashioning vocabulary, political vocabulary in a certain sense. And uh, uh, this is fundamentally different from, you know, coming up with a program. And this distinction gets lost uh, uh, very, very, very often. And I'm not sure about the periodization. I, I'd, I'd say we have like a lot, a lot of spontaneity uh, movements going on. 
uh, today, nowadays. So I wouldn't say it's all about programmatism right now. So, but but we do have those tendencies. It's I think they are distributed temporally, historically, in a bit uh, different uh, manner. I, I would say that I'm not sure if everybody agrees or maybe somebody else uh, disagrees. Yeah, just to complement before passing along, uh, just the fact that we have the Workers' Party, you know. 10 years of the Workers' Party first, now it's back in power. Like, this has an effect on the political ecology mm -hmm. that is, you know, not having a program when you can just delegate it to the government. So it's, a, it's a particular thing. I'm not sure you guys have had that, you know, to, to compare. No, I mean, we've never had a Workers' Party. Uh, I was also laughing in my head because I used to teach in, uh, in Mexico and I was talking about, yeah, I used to teach philosophy in Mexico. Uh, we've never taught philosophy in American public schools. So... <laughs> Um, so, you know, it would be nice to have that fight. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot here and, and I am thinking, uh, like a person who, who, who moves between worlds a lot about how to translate different vocabularies and if they can be translated. Um, but it seems like a lot of what you're doing is orientational and lens related. So the reason why you would construct a particular vocabulary is the ability to express things in particular ways to cut against concepts in particular ways. So you can see different things, right? It's, it's a toolbox lens. And, and that is also to me, orientational, like where are you orienting? Where are you looking? Where are you looking where other people's aren't? Um, and I find that useful um, because a lot of my frustrations with the left as it exists in the U.S. and Canada, uh, and as a person who spent a long time outside of the United States, has had trouble adjusting to this culture, um, is that um, the orientational lens actually is often never there. Um, you're jumping from a base of like political sentiment and then trying to establish a program and a strategy um, without ever really establishing an orientation or a definition. Um, you know, like most of a lot of the U.S. left rhetoric is kind of floating signifiers, for lack of a better term. Um, we don't agree on what a lot of these basic things are. And the terms that often become popular are even more obscure. My favorite, my favorite one is my least favorite one, and that's professional managerial class, a term that no one can fucking define. Um, even though it sounds like it would have a definition in its name, but it doesn't. <laughs> the, um, th these things are, are are super are super interesting, and I think uh, a lot of the leadership of the R left here because it has been so instantiated in academia because we don't have a workers party uh, well, because we don't have any fucking party other than the two that we have. Um, it is, it leads to a, a, a different set of problems. There's also a tendency right now in America, and I don't know how familiar you are with this with American social Democrats who like to like pretend that somehow like Brazil is a mirror of the United States in some weird way. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, as not as a person who's, you know, I've never even been to Brazil. I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, but in, in, in a lot of ways, I just feel like when people describe Lula as some kind of figure like Obama or Bernie Sanders or both like are the workers party as the same thing as the DSA or conversely Bolsonaro as the same thing as Trump and, uh, the Bolsonarist as the same thing as Trumpist in America, I often feel like there's something fundamental being missing, even if the analogy does somewhat hold. Uh, how, um, when you're working internationally, although you um, most of you do seem to be out of Brazil looking at the names, uh, also that I've seen signed on the articles and whatnot, um, how do you deal with these kind of conceptions? Because a lot of these logics, you know, of worlds are very perspective to a particular region that might completely misunderstand or not have any of the lens that you would have, say, from being in Brasilia right now. Anyone want to respond to that? Or you can tell me I'm full of shit. That's also okay. It's totally allowable. 
Oh, um, so I actually was going to say something before, but we can segue that into the uh, stuff about the Brazilian left. But just from the U.S. organizing perspective, which might also help shine a kind of a different light on the themes of this conversation, is that like I find it, I find what you said actually really interesting, uh, Dirk, and the idea of like um, on the one hand having people sort of unite around certain forms of political sentiment, and then on the other hand having these sort of like floating signifiers where people can't actually really agree on what they mean and they may be a little bit detached from a certain practice. Part of what I'm so interested in what STP is providing um, and like, you know, what I'm also trying to provide with STP is this idea that what JP was talking about of the sort of like organizational, um, like theoretical toolkit and vocabularies that are being fashioned. Because then when you have a, I mean, in a way, the really ambitious thing here implicitly is that it's kind of a redefinition of like the relation of the intellectual with the masses. At least that's sort of how I'm starting to think about it is that it's kind of like, instead of providing a, a program or even instead of providing like, um, you know, just sort of practical organization of spontaneity, you are providing like very specific theoretically elaborated like vocabularies and ways to think about things and ways to compose and stitch different things together. But you are trying to connect them instead of to, instead of to like a particular kind of program that is set forward by intellectuals in a certain kind of way, although there can be some of that as well in different contexts. Um, it can also be connected, I guess, to certain forms of practice where you're actually looking for um, politics to be able to think itself on its own terms and use those vocabularies to think itself on its own terms. I, I think this really, really connects to one of the, the issues that we discussed in the in our latest paper on crisis and critique about the problem of vulgarization. Because the, the problem of vulgarization is it's exactly that point. You have like some some element, some signifiers, some floating signifiers, which everyone can share, but the heter heterogeneity of social space is this is split in, in a manner in which these signifiers they do not actually connect anything. They actually reveal that there may be some 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 disconnection. And, and when we think about this, this is, and this is, I think, one of the, the good, uh, disco not discoveries, because I think it's very well grounded in a certain tradition in Brazilian critical theory, uh, which is the idea that uh, instead of the, it's, instead of the, the, the metropolis, the centers of capitalist world being the, the direction where everything is, aiming towards in, in, in different ways, different, uh, different speeds. And there is a, there is a, 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 strange, uh, a strange inversion where it seems like more and more the centers are looking like the periphery. And mm. that's in, in a sense, and what is the periphery? It's not simply that you're going backwards. The, perifer the, the peripheral element is rather the misalignment of the social space. The fact that there is not a social homogeneity anymore that allows for certain uh, elements to circle and to connect and to entangle. So like, if you look at, uh, like, for example, in, in, in Brazil, I think it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting problem because, for example, we have here uh, the, prob the, the, the a workers' party that was in government for like 14 years, like six, 16, no, yeah, 14 years, which is like, wow, it's, it's, it's a lot of time. And there is a whole generation that was uh, formed under the shadow of the workers' party and a certain future and a certain idea of like finally a job society is coming to Brazil. And then what happens in the last 10 years is precarization, less uh, job rights, etc. And if we look at like the, the, the elections in 2018, the Bolsonaro elections, it was very weird because even if the Workers' Party was like a party that really affected change in the history of Brazil, they were like, we are go there was like this, this uh, paper question that it presented to the candidates like what are you going to do uh, after the election or after your government and like the workers party candidate which was not lula because lula was in jail at the time mm -hmm. he said every brazilian is going to have a, a, a workers 
license, uh, workers, uh, I, I don't know how to say carteirinha de carteira de trabalho, but it's like a, a document where you put on, where if you have a legal job with legal rights, it's in that, in that, uh, in that notebook, it's like a little notebook that every, every formal worker has in Brazil. And it was completely vain. It was, I mean, vapid. It didn't make any sense with the social reality because there were like informal jobs were the majority. And right. so it, it wasn't a question. I mean, we had to defend, for example, workers' rights. This was a topic. This was defended. But even if we defended them, it didn't connect anymore to the social structure. So I think that uh, what, what Anna was saying, and I think how this connects is like, Uh, the attempt at fashioning vocabularies is also an attempt at dealing with this vulgarization. It's not mm -hmm. simply a matter of the, uh, of a flow of theory. Like we have to find the best concept. We have like to literally remake the the relations that were that are not given anymore. And sometimes uh, the left has a tendency to fall back into uh, the habit, like uh, oh, we are for formal employment. But you know the social the social uh, terrain uh, actually disagrees at this, at this at this moment. So you have to navigate uh, between what is you know, the, the traditional commitments of the left that are in a certain sense well justified for formal employment and all that all of that. But at the same time, like the, the informal uh, kind of jobs are are kind of a, a practical uh, option for the majority of the population. For instance. In the last uh, election, uh, Lula said something to the extent that he will, was going to formalize every informal job out there. And this was badly received. Everybody, oh, but I am a MEI, Microempreendedor Individual, which is a category of, you know, you can make like a, uh, it's almost like a, a little, you know, a, a company that you have, an individual company. You, you, you have a number like as, as, you, as if you were an entrepreneur. In, in English, it would be a contractor, but yeah. Contractor, okay, great. So uh, everybody was kind of uh, pissed, uh, everybody, at least a large part, large part, of, large part of the people who would vote for Lula was kind of pissed of, uh, about that. So there is a misalignment also between what, what are the traditional beliefs of the left, and, uh, which comes with their own also vocabularies in a certain sense. So this is also the necessity for a certain vocabulary that can could mediate between these different languages that, you know, codify different sets of beliefs in a certain sense, in a kind of uh, social terrain that is so fragmented that you can't really rely on what your traditional habitual kind of set of, you know, traditional leftist, uh, pro-people beliefs, populist beliefs, whatever, like uh, beliefs, uh, uh, you know, good beliefs, <laughs> morally good beliefs or anything like that. This, this does not really, this is, this is, this is also, this is why you really need kind of uh, to navigate between a very heterogeneous scene. And this is why this is kind of the, also explains why you get this split between, oh, we won't organize anything. We are kind of the insurrectionist left, or we are kind of Leninist. We have to put a straight jacket onto this process and try to, arrive at something, whereas maybe you need something in the middle. You need some, some kind of notions that would organize cognitively, epistemically first, like or immanently, not, not really first, but at the same time, what is happening. So this is this is also shed some light in, in that in that necessity of navigating between the different languages and different sets of beliefs, because you can't really rely on you know your old kind of uh, Habits in a certain sense. Lula was was acting on habit, like oh, everybody wants to wants a formal job. This is was kind of the you know implicit commitment there, which is not not really true anymore in a certain sense. This is a problem. Maybe it, it should be true, but this is another debate, a different debate. Uh, you know? Can I just jump in on this? Of course, uh, just because I think that it that it's a really good segue to something that is like. It just helps to align a bunch of things we said into like a nice little package for mm -hmm. because I, I have the impression we also didn't have a chance to kind of because it's hard to present it at all but what we've been working on in a way like if you open a text why does it look so weird if you open one of our texts or watch one of our meetings and i think we can with all this crazy talk for now in this large-scale discussion you can give a bit of a, a context to that now because 
I would say that a, a good way to frame this is to think, okay, so let's say you buy this one hypothesis that for us makes a lot of sense in the Brazilian context, at least, that with a certain, certain moment we're living in capitalism in large kind of peripheries like Brazil, but other countries confirm this as well, you had such level of social heterogeneity. You can go three blocks to the left and you make no sense anymore to people. And you mm -hmm. can use certain discourse on your online platform or your social network. And if you're an honest person, you know nobody has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, And you need to know how to use the words, but they don't know what they refer to exactly. So what we realize is that that kind of context that has as a background, this level of social heterogeneity, it has a direct effect on the leftist organizations embedded in that context. You will get fragments of leftist organization which are locally sensible. They make mm. sense if you look at what's around them, but they are not composable in regional spaces, in larger scales. They simply cannot get, a, it's not like morally get along or, or personal problems or even ideological problems in the sense that they are part of an individualistic uh, ideological environment. It's actually the contrary. The more you engage with the concrete situation where you are, you will produce a political language that is valid in that context and not necessarily valid somewhere else. It's not because you're not a good Marxist, you're not talking about class. You will talk differently about class in different places and it will mean, mean exactly. slightly different things in different places. So that underlying social diagnosis requires us to translate it to the political sphere of how organizations think their strategy, organize themselves internally and in their environments, right? And uh, it, it, this poses a challenge because you cannot assume a meta level where you just give everyone a good program because this is rooted in the actual material situations. It is rational to develop slightly different ways of dealing with things if the contexts are slightly different. So you need very interesting fine tuning of this vocabulary that Saron talked about so that you can talk about what is invariant and how mm -hmm. do you approach invariances that first cannot just be a discursive thing. It's not like you're going to find the proper way of talking. So you need to match how can organizations change. So there must be actual practices that make it easier for us to compose together while respecting so it's not a, a matter of theory in that sense. That's why it's not a theory of composition. It's a theory of how to organize and compose better organizations. So this is a good just to, when you get a grasp of the type of problem, and if you accept our premise that this peripheral situation tends to expand, the more capitalism can organize value without organizing workers in the way that it had to. You don't need to go into the details of the different ways we can explain why different sorts of uh, forms of accumulation might bypass the need to put people in the same place, make them have similar experiences. Well, the moment that I can extract surplus without producing that, you know, collateral, interesting homogeneity, the tendency is, is that this sort of heterogeneity, social heterogeneity that leads to political heterogeneity will spread across the world. So working out on this, let's say, compositional theory, which is tracking simultaneously this vocabulary issue that Saron raised with the organizational practices that will give a reference to this vocabulary, right? Uh, this is pretty much why our texts are full of diagrams <laughs> and crazy language, you know? So I think it's just to, 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 to show people also who might be interested in what we're doing, how this, this bunch of things that sound a bit disconnected when you discuss them separately, there is actually an interesting line that connects them all to the type of project we're interested in and why you know, it's a concrete problem. It might require very abstract tools to think through. Uh, what would be, you know, like even if you just think about what, how do you accept contexts are highly variable and still talk about invariances? That, that has a scientific tonality to it, right? Um, but just to give a kind of a kind of packaged view of, of, I think, where we are right now. You know, this is the sort of thing we're losing our sleeps over. So also to um, jump off of that a little bit with respect to my experience with the U.S. left, I think to a large extent, a lot of this has already happened in the U.S. Like a lot of the like peripheralization of like um, <clears throat> different struggles. And like, I mean, you can look at this going back a while, like and just in terms of like the 
I mean, people like Mark Fisher had critiqued it in terms of like, it's turning into like brands and stuff. But instead of, I think, just denouncing that, I think we should understand that that's expressing to some extent a reality of the misalliance space. And so my, my experience, one of the things that I was involved with a little bit, I, I kind of like stepped back from it for most of, most of its um, development, but the Marxist Center project in the US that was trying to bring together like base building, dual power groups, like largely sort of headed up by Philly socialists, right? And I was really interested in that project because I mean, if it, it was another kind of thing of like trying to stitch together local struggles based on like people kind of, you know, organizing, not not purely in an insurrectionary way, not necessarily in like a sort of top down way, but like building a party kind of from the bottom up in a certain sense. I was interested in that kind of tendency. But it is really interesting how, you know, that project failed and dissolved. Um, and to sort of look back at how that happened and why that happened and the ways that happened. I, I mean, you know, like Tim Morris, who was a really big figure in, in the development of that, talked about it in terms of like he was worried about um, it being like, a lot of the organizing was happen happening internal to like the activist left and sort of people who kind of already all spoke the same languages as each other and then sort of recognized each other and speaking some of those same languages, I feel like rather than actually, you know, organizing people who they had to, <laughs> had to work on, you know, speaking languages they might not be as comfortable with. And I mean, I feel like there's a lot to be said about that and I'm not totally sure exactly where I would orient towards that now, but a lot of the stuff that I feel like SDB has been working towards is not just ways of speaking to other people who have read the theory, for example, but thinking about procedures and like approaches to how we think about how we th talk to people <laughs> who like might not have a lot of the same reference points or like how to actually almost sort of do a certain kind of political translation is a, a something that I'm really interested in. And I think that like um, a lot of what SDB does is sort of like using the theoretical toolkits in a very rigorous way to think about how like procedurally and organizationally we could do things like political translation and the composition of differences. There's a lot to respond to there. I mean, these are problems that I think about a lot myself when I think about organizational tendencies, the tendency of something to be optimized at one level and for one environment. And the moment you try to translate that to anything else, uh, it, 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 it dissolves. Um, uh, I also, Anna, uh, you may or may not know this. I was on, uh, I was involved very, very before the conference, even, uh, early on with the Marxist center and, uh, the organization I was with dissolved before, uh, the Marxist center even started, uh, for similar kinds of tensions that dissolved the Marxist center later. Um, in, in the U.S. context, and here I'm being very specific to the U.S. context, uh, we have things that are optimized for the national level and optimized for the very local level, but nothing in between. And either regionally and often not even on the level of a state uh, or, you know, what everyone else would call province, um, that that often is also because people cannot talk to do not have the orientation to talk to people from outside their immediate context even within the same culture even within the same language um that's a huge problem and there's there's also a way in which people will try to pander to the quote working class unquote um without actually addressing the fact that the working class is very different by section region temperament, whether it's urban or rural, whether yeah, uh, stuff that works in Brooklyn will not work here in Utah, even though they're both, quote, well, I live in a, quote, liberal city, unquote. Um, all these things are are very variable. Um, but I also really do resonate with the peripheralization of more and more elements of, uh, of society, um, because I do think that... I, there's a tendency of the U.S. left liberal to talk about how America is becoming a, quote, third world country, unquote, uh, which having lived in, quote, third world countries, unquote, um, I can ass assure them is absolutely not the case. However, um, even I have remarked that how, like, the difference between, say, living in Cairo or living in uh, Mexico and living in the United States feels thinner than it did 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and those are, that's an interesting phenomena. 
Um, wh- how you deal with that politically is also, I think, rather interesting. And, you know, one of the things that I think that you're, I would refer to the diagrams and stuff as thinking things orientationally and directionally. I also tend to like, weird cybernetic diagrams that that actually lay out flow charts that probably don't represent much but do help you think about the way things are embedded in other things and how systems move and change as you move and change within a system um wasn't thinking i was going to talk about this today actually i thought i was going to talk about psychoanalysis uh so good on you um one of i think that is useful for thinking about how to to deal with these things that are obviously similar. Um, there is a way, like when I started this question, I, and I, I like the indirect way uh, you peeps answered it um, by by talking about the peripheralization. Um, there's a way in which like the US context and the Brazilian context is very radically different as we've even talked about here. We don't have it like form all employment, even contractor employments effectively formal. And we do have a gray and black market, but it's such a small part of our society that we don't hardly talk about it. But there's also ways in which every problem that you just described as a kind of orientation or a habit, such as for example, uh, full card check unionization based on like 1950s industrial models in the United States. Um, That is the way the left talks about unionizing in America. And that hasn't existed really since the 1970s. Um, And, and also what it's done here is created this weird phenomenon where unions are popular again, but no one's actually in them, like at all. Like, the, in fact, unionization density is going down. Um, and and the and it's a similar problem to like when you guys are talking about we need formal employment because formal employment means formal representation, formal rights, etc. Um, and yet, a lot of people don't want to be tied up in that for reasons that are maybe not optimal, but perfectly rational in quotations, whatever rational means um for their immediate circumstances right and so thinking about this in a different way is really important um uh, how how much of of this communication oddly is about making it you know when i approach one of your texts i was looking at the atlas of experimental politics uh which uh i'm i've, I've read like five times um and i think i understand about 50 percent of it um, and maybe I'm being arrogant there, but, um, there is a way in which I find that it made certain things strange that was actually productive, that it got me thinking about the way, uh, systems may be parallel and different contexts and how I could think about these contexts differently and what expansion and different levels of organization would look like even though I'm also like struggling to make sense of the actual meaning of the text. Um, And I felt like that was deliberate. Um, And when Gabriel said what he said, it made me even more suspicious that it was deliberate. Um, So is that part of your methodology in this, in this theory language is to, you know, because we all know we have to talk in different contexts and, and we have to move around, but to, to 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 set up a, a a kind of theoretical lens that does make you think about things in different ways and moves between different ways of communicating what you know um, modeling what you're going to have to do as an organizer in some way. I'm gonna turn that over to you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to go on that first. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, seeing you talk about that plus Derek, uh, because it's a uh, like some robust text and it was written by like uh, I don't know I, I thought I think it was twelve twelve people or correct mm-hmm. I think fourteen people yeah twelve fourteen yeah it was, I was like I didn't remember the yeah. number but yeah and it, it is a methodology it's, it's something that has to do with uh, the method that we um started uh that we came up to deal with this uh 
crowd, <laughs> crowded amount of researchers. And I think that it's really nice that it's uh, like, um, how do you say collaging in English? Like we can't, like we couldn't glue theories. Uh, collaging. Collaging. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so uh, that that that's it. We uh, it's a exercise of composing together. is an exercise of uh, not only translating things, but also to make uh, like we making sense in this um, like. Uh, it's a big picture, and then we funnel, and then at, at the same time, we are dealing with uh, really different uh, styles that they may uh, appear, but in the end, there is a really direct and linear structure. Like, and I think that the diagrams are a part, a really important part of that, because they are a way to make things uh, more intelligible, and I think there is a nice uh, thing that is to be as a whole where it's about that to make things uh, intelligible and to uh, make things uh, like that people people can really find their way through the text. Like I don't know if that makes sense to you all, but I think that is something that really preoccupies the members of the SCP, and that maybe appears on the text. Uh, I was going to say something that you, I was going to comment on something that you said. Uh, oh my God, I forgot. There was something that appeared in the beginning also. Anyways, if I remember, I'll say it uh, later. <laughs> I think that there's something I'd like to add to, to what Fernanda said, because I think she went straight to the point, which is like, if we are able to understand ourselves, that probably means something, meaning that we are like 14 different people with 14 different backgrounds, with 14 styles, bibliographical references. So I, I think the, uh, the, the effort of composition internally that she was talking about, I think it gives us a pretty good measuring stick for how we are going to be understandable outside. Like if we get to it's not going to be any of our ideas that are going to be there because we will have, each one of us will have to like move around, uh, drop some commitments, add on others that might be initially strange. And I think the result is uh, building statements, political statements, uh, or as, as Caron said, uh, form of a, fashion, a newly fashioned vocabulary that will not be a vocabulary, vocabulary that is any of our, that is not of each one of us, in a sense. Like, we all learn to talk in STP, and that may sound a bit uh, a strange, but I think, like, since we have different backgrounds, it's more of an effort of subtraction than simply addition. And I think in that sense, uh, as, as Fernanda was saying, and I think she's one of the most involved in, in this aspect, uh, this is not simply a problem of tying together different vocabularies because we are different people with different habits. Some people have different jobs, different commitments to the STP in different uh, levels. So there's like, it, it's, it, there's also this problem of organizing ourselves in a sense. So if I could add a little bit to that, I feel like, I mean, it's a really crazy experience. Like I'm working with the SDP on a collaborative text right now that is like, I'm like having to rethink the way that I approach writing to a certain extent in this process. Because it's like, you know, I, I feel like I'm used to this way of approaching writing where it's like, I want to have like the right answer, quote unquote, in a certain way. But in order to sort of compose what I want to say, what I'm thinking about, with what everybody else is doing, to some extent, it's sort of like you you have to kind of like relax a little bit that that temptation to like want to have a right answer, to want to say <laughs> a clear thing, even, um, and like sort of have to think about what are the ways to express the points that come up in the process of trying to communicate with each other. That that maybe it sacrifices a little bit of a certain kind of like I would say even like illusion of immediate clarity, right? 
But in the process of sacrificing some of that, it, it actually does force you to think. It forces you to think through the difference between what you're saying and what somebody else is saying and what, what those different things might mean. Um, and this is actually a lot of why I'm attracted to like the whole sort of like like French theory, Marxism, whatever. Like a lot of people think it's sort of like being um, like purposefully obtuse. I don't think it's always even like a like a purposeful thing so much as it can even just sort of be an effect of a certain kind of fragmented space and people who are trying to deal with that fragmented space in a certain way. And like, I think it's no accident that a lot of the interest in that kind of language comes up in places that are dealing with certain kinds of fragmentation or even certain kinds of trauma. Like it came out of post-war France, right? And like, you see the ways that it's taken up by all sorts of like very marginal social groups in different, in different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, so I, I think that like people act like it's, you know, so, so a lot of like kind of, I guess, more empiricist leaning people. And like, I, I, I have some sympathy for certain kinds of empiricism, but some more empiricist leaning people will sort of like interpret this in terms of, well, this might, this seems elitist. This seems like, you know, you're like speaking from a position of like someone with a PhD or something. But um, I feel like actually, if you sort of, take a step back from like some of the assumptions that you might project and some of the like, I guess very sort of negative or even hostile assumptions you're reading sort of bad motives in, into a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> and you try to listen to maybe why someone might be talking like that and what, <clears throat> what, that, what practice that might be a result of as well. I think that um, it creates something that can have a really positive effect in terms of how you look at the world generally. Uh, can I just just mention something real quick on the Atlas thing? Just because I mean, first of all, I'm, I apologize that you had to read it five times. I mean, it's like a, a massive chunk of weird text, and knowing how it was produced, because but we are very uh, honored. Yeah. I mean, five. No, times. We are definitely honored. Yeah, I mean, we read it more than we did probably. Uh, but uh, and 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 your rate of understanding is like on par with ours, perhaps, if you take the, the average of the group. Uh, but just to say something which I think goes to this and connects to, to some other points that are important, which is, you know, I, I try to pro propose this image where you get to understand some of the strategic and kind of ways we fail as leftists by embedding us in a larger diagnosis of what's going on with this peripherization thing. But if you go, if you want to be rigorous with it, we, you need to embed what we are doing that because if we're a small organization inside this ecological this ecology of organizations inside this larger situation this should affect us as well so i think that one thing we've learned to trust even though the results are very mixed and i think the atlas is a very mixed result of that i mean it makes no sense to pretend like it's a clear text or if, if it has the shape of something we would like to reproduce on purpose but it is the effect of trusting that if you are locally inside a larger space and if you're optimally placed in that space, meaning you are occupying positions that have the properties of the space as a whole in some sense. So the space is fractured. It has very, very heterogeneous context within it. Well, you create an organization that has that similar structure. If you solve that problem locally, you will be contributing to something which can be scaled up. So the very small scale question of how do you write with, you know, post-punk, anarcho-communist, institutional policy makers. Uh, I mean, most of us are not academics. They're like neuroscientists. There are some business people. There are people working in the food service industry. There are people, you know, trying to get their degrees. It's quite a mixed environment. So if you manage to come up with a method where that works in your favor, and one of the conditions for this to work, as we've seen thus far, is that you need to kind of trust that something that is kind of confusing while you're trying to glue it. You can only, only locally glue one thing to another, as Anna was saying. Like, you need to sacrifice a bit the way you would present things to make sure that it goes with what the next person is saying and kind of work it out locally. Afterwards, you can look at the global result, and it will have some properties which, first, don't match your own criteria, but weirdly, hopefully, second, it will match the situation's criteria because you created an artificial space with properties that match the space, the properties of the space. So that's called an experiment. 
to create mm. an artificial place that's properly positioned without the right interferences so that solutions in that local space reflect properties of a larger space, right? So this is something that I think gives the group a bit of a strange consistency because it is an organizational endeavor. It concerns itself very much with practical problems of doing this research itself. And we do kind of think there is some correlation. We're still trying to, to work out exactly what it is between how we organize and what are the properties of this end product we produce. Like, because the theories that come out don't really represent anyone's exact background or influences, the way we write. I mean, the Atlas was an attempt. It, it's definitely not something we're repeating. Uh, and the latest things we've done look very different. Uh, but I feel like that connection remains, you know, with, with something we're trying to, to, to both understand theoretically, if it makes sense, to claim that cooperation under these conditions can produce something that is greater than the sum of the parts that is, you know, meaningful to a situation. Uh, but also it's something we're still trying to formalize and, and, and kind of understand procedurally as well, like as a method to, of work. Hence the confusion in the meeting with here with many people, you know, it's part of that. So to, to both uh, glom onto that in, in one sense and to uh, point out where I actually appreciate the fracturedness and seeming incomprehensibility. Um, I spent two years of my life decoding a collectively written series of texts by endnotes uh, for a show. Um, and I read it more than, than four times. And it, and it seemed uh, cohesive in a way that, say, the Atlas does not. Uh, but it wasn't. Um, when you actually spend that much time with a, t with a collectively written text where it has a veneer of, um, of polish, uh, eventually you find the fractures. And the fractures are theoretically interesting. They also w were problems for the history and self-justification that Innotes was trying to tell itself. And so when I approach a text that is obviously fractured, obviously experimental, and I come out of experimental poetry myself, I'm used to it, um, I actually appreciate the fact that it is upfront about the both collective nature of its composition and the differences and doesn't try to just sand those differences off. Um, but I also realized that if you're going to try to like have a working political tax, something as strange as the Atlas is probably going to be a little, <laughs> uh, intimidating. <laughs> um, so, you know, I definitely see, see the issue th there. Um, you, you made a point that I, that I think a lot about myself, which is how any organization or even your own conception of your mind is embedded in your society. And there's a lot of issues where leftists realize that about everybody else <laughs> yes but then but then don't think about that about themselves at all um you know it's it's it is the uh I, I, it's a it's a perspective problem because you, you know your eyes point out and you can see how everyone else is fractured and don't necessarily see how you're, you you are fractured yourself but I think that point is crucial for organ for trying to organize right now, because um, oh, there are a lot of ways in which things have shifted for good and ill. I don't think all the shifts are bad, even, um, but they've shifted, and we see how they've affected everybody else, but we don't see how they've affected the left except sometimes when the left critiques itself and then again there's an even more special pleady like well i'm the person who sees the truth about how all the rest of you are full of shit and um of course with the self-exemption of well yeah but you probably need an analyst too you are also probably full of shit um i you know i i, I kind of have the egalitarian view that we're all fairly deluded um, so I, I appreciate that about what you're doing because you seem to be aware in your production of text and in your organization of the collective kind of semi chaos that this can seem like that there, there is a sense in where like, yeah, we are reflecting the fact that we are also products of this whole situation. 
Um, if, uh, and there, there's so much here. Um, I, I find it, I find it very interesting to try to, uh, deal with a project that is so varied as this and so collective, um, and, and it is it is obviously also individual. I can tell when you look at some of the things you sent me that people's particular backgrounds and particular obsessions are showing up. Um, generally, I don't know people who are into Bogdanov who are also into Badu. Those are usually not two things I encounter together. Um, although I guess it's like pineapple and chocolate or something. It probably does work. Um <laughs> Uh, so can that uh, be a t-shirt? Are we uh, are we allowed to turn that into a t-shirt? Sure, <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, I I think that that spirit's really useful right now. And I do do you encounter a lot of pushback on that kind of um eclecticism? Because I do. Like I know that one of the major criticisms of of my own work is that I pull from eighty five different things and none of them seem to be related and people get really mad about that. So I think this this point is like it's really good what you this uh, dissonance because because I, I really think that there are two two forms of, of approaching this problem of how to how to mix theory uh, and what is the guiding principle of this mixing because of course i mean it's like it's this unsufferable debate about the the reception of post structuralist thought in america I mean, it, it, it's, it came to Brazil. It's like, oh, you guys don't, nobody understands because these texts are, they are being, uh, ex uh, they're being separated from their original context. So they will never be understood. Okay. That's like, people will have this discussion like, oh, you can't read Derrida with Adorno, with Deleuze or whatever. But when they go to connect, okay, let's connect these texts together instead of like okay it's it's important you if you want to understand these these thinkers these systems you have to connect them to the ground but the ground is not a ground it's like oh you should read Canguilhem you should read uh, French uh, science science of uh, philosoph philosophy of science or whatever and of course that's correct of course they are not like uh, postmodern thinkers in the sense that the idea of postmodern thinkers exists in American universities, of course. But I think what gets left out is you don't need a binding theory. Like, uh, you, you don't need to connect theoretically these points if you have a certain reference that binds together these thinkers. And I think that's like the really weird thing because I think my favorite thinkers they they tend to be not the ones who are uh, like systematically historiographically consistent of course that is that exists of course i appreciate that but if you take for example uh uh i don't know i think i think Paju is a good example the way he deals with the history of philosophy is completely subjective <laughs> he's interested in a set of problems that make the mixture bind together I think if we get also, for example, Brazilian critical theory, which is a very weird mix, it's like some secondary literature of histor uh, historiography of philosophy, like Gehu, like uh, Quahe, those kinds of guys that are not read anywhere as primary texts except in Brazil in the 70s, which it was really a thing. And it helped them solve a lot of their problems in how to read Marx, for example. It's not because Marx was, because there's like, Caron works a lot with Janotti, and uh, which is this Brazilian ex-Marxist thinker. I mean, he's really weird. He can talk about, he's like weird. He's all, all yeah, okay. He cannot- no need, no need to open that can of worms today. Yeah, okay, but, but, the, but the example is like, he will mix things, not because they are theoretically visibly in the, in this out, out, in the outside, but because there is a gravitational pull that will make the 
the binding makes sense. And I think like that, I, I really found it interesting that you mentioned this point about uh, our incons our like superficial strangeness, and also that there are there's a, an effect of estrangement that is produced. And I think it's only possible to be produced because in a sense, there is a matter at hand, there's a, a set of problems. And I think like the heterogeneity of social spaces is one of our biggest problems, which is the criteria for dealing with authors. And I think like that's the, the and, and I, I think actually that's like the, I, I'm, I'm not one of the people involved in the, in the more, uh, formal experimentations that are in STP because this is like one of the points of the group. Not everyone is up to par, but that's what Gabriel said. Like, if you understood 50% of the Atlas, this is like right on. That makes of you one of us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah because, uh, but from what I understand as, as, as someone who is interested but is not yet engaged, uh, it's not a matter of, oh, formal systems will explain everything it's more of like formal investigation is uh, a process to allow us to make certain points that concern us treatable and i think that's where the mix-up of baju and bogdan of which i don't know because now i'm from the inside so for me it's like it's not i know that outside it's strange but it seems natural from the inside because it makes sense for the problems being treated definitely the problem first thing is a huge part of it and like that's a lesson I took out of my own organizing experience is that you get a lot farther treating the problems and like ways to solve the problems than sort of like making up solutions before you necessarily even know what the problems are um but it's also I wanted to say like it totally changed the way that I engaged with like the history of philosophy and like how I read theory to <clears throat> get to become like part of the STP um, and like my background is sort of interesting because like I got really into Badu like a few years ago, like around the time that like we met Derek, like I was really into Badu. Um, and I then think I may thought... have made fun of you for it. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. And I got um, kind of increasingly frustrated with some aspects of his philosophy and sort of moved on to like some other things. I got really into Karatani a little bit before I got involved with SDP. Um, and I was getting really into like Stafford beers, like Bible system model, cybernetics. Um, and then it was it was funny that like when I plugged back into STP, like all of a sudden I had to like revisit Bidu and like get, get try to start getting excited about him in different ways again that I did not expect I was going to. And I ended up getting a lot deeper into Bogdanov than I had expected I would at all. Like I, I was interested in Bogdanov, but I was mostly focused on like later developments in cybernetics. But by like trying to stitch that crazy like Bedu Bogdanov like link that was that was set up in the process of trying to solve these problems like i am totally in agreement that it like it works in a really weird way but like in a really effective way and in an exciting way because it kind of crosses um it crosses these tendencies you wouldn't expect to cross and the fact that they do cross in some way already kind of opens up a different way of looking at things i think um yeah i'm now thinking about how I can tie in Wilfred Sarlers and the German historical school into this somehow. Um, no, but in all, in, in all seriousness, um, uh, I think a lot of us have anxiety of influence about like the first theorists we fall in love with. And, and um, for me as Adorno, then, and then, and, and then uh, when I was, became a professor in South Korea, uh, Bedu was like the hit new thing that all the English people were were diving into superficially and so i was primed to engage with it but engage with it from a point of hate um and and recently uh myself have started being like oh there you know he's got some good points i'm going to go back and reread the logic of worlds and maybe um the theory of the subject and come with a more uh pliable you know mind of like well what what can i what can I raid from this text and use and not use? And um, since uh, uh, Raphael has admitted, um, Raphael, uh, that uh, it is totally subjective and now I'm free to just raid it. Um, uh, I, I want to, we've been on, we've been talking for about an hour and a half and uh, I think, um, 
I will be in contact with with you with you to have your group back on with maybe a few different people in a couple of months because there's so much here and I, I actually am becoming uh, strangely fascinated. I'm going to go watch more of your videos, but um, and so I'll give you a more specific po topic next time than just your general project. But um, if you were going to, you know, ask a bunch of random um you know my audience is highly uh diverse it's highly heterogeneous um and uh, uh in, even in region and i'm often sometimes confused by who listens and where they're from um apparently have a big fan base in sweden for some reason i don't understand <laughs> um and uh I, I, uh, I, I, how would you tell people to approach your project if they were interested in what you're doing and maybe learning from you or getting involved in some way? We're doing the famous deixa que eu deixo in Portuguese, like, let, let me let you do it. And then nobody does anything. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it's a, so, a soccer. Am I, am I glad you barbarians say soccer? It's a soccer term. Like let me. Oh, let I, say, you no, I, I say football, but I because I spent enough yeah, time you, in Mexico to be correct. You've been enlightened, yes, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not sure if anyone wants to take it up. Like, uh, yeah, sure. So look, I'm just say something about this. Uh, I think that there are a couple of ways these days that people uh, uh, can engage because I I also think it's worth mentioning this because. I've realized uh, by just having to deal with how it has, how we, how this reverberates inside the group, that we were. It's very hard to be responsible for doing something where the 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 whole is larger than the sum of the parts, because you know you're doing just a small bit, but people who see from the outside see this larger thing and assume everyone is doing the larger thing. So if anyone watching this goes on YouTube, finds our little YouTube channel, and listens to our meeting. They might come out, as I think most of us did at some point, with the impression that they should know about all those things if they want to join, they want to come to a meeting, if they want to, uh, you know, engage. And it's a very strange paradox we produce because it's a group devised to welcome people coming from very different backgrounds uh, to, I mean, the very basic methodology of how we work, which is we meet every Monday, a member presents about whatever they want. Uh, we do ask people to try to stitch their personal interests to other people's interests, but we do trust, as we, I said before, that with time, this shared superposition of things will emerge. So you don't need to worry that much about it. So locally, it seems very simple. Just come, present, watch a meeting, you'll find a place. Once you look from the outside, you will see like this mesh of topics. They are weirdly glued and connected to one another because we've been becoming we're becoming better at it as well. So it can be a bit intimidating if you because you're you know inside you just see a part, but from the outside you see the whole. So the first thing I think it's worth sharing with people who might be interested is that you know the good thing the, the thing that is I think you should be enthusiastic about is that people who are much dumber than the total product of what we did managed to produce that total product. Like we're all much less smart than we look. If you read the final text, we're just, you know, we know small bits of this and we glue it together and we're becoming good at doing that. I think, I mean, Marx and Engels only wrote a text, you know, two people, like we managed 14, like we're, you know, history is progressing slow. So, uh, but I think that that's, that's a relevant thing to tell people so that they don't get kind of intimidated about it, that there are many mechanisms in the group to welcome people who are interested in a small bit of it. They think they can contribute with a small part of it. And we, I mean, we're definitely not nearly in a place where this is, you know, totally oiled up and facilitated. It's still a hard process, but I think it's, it's quite surprising how it can be kind of accessible. Uh, but you don't need to, like, join the group to participate. All our meetings are open. You can just come and watch one or watch a recording afterwards. Uh, and we're also doing a, a type of work these days, and we're trying to actually engage more from that perspective, which is 
rather than having people individually coming over and trying to to participate just you know as new members we're also doing more work with other organizations so getting we were have been contacted by different groups that want to share their experience with the group and see how we see whatever it is that they are doing and doing exactly as Caron said you know seeing if other vocabularies sometimes make interesting you know points clearer decision points more obvious in a process things like this uh, most of those work has more, most of that work has been done with organizations that already had contact with members but it's been happening more also with people who just approach us because they read our stuff or saw some of our meetings so there are many different ways to arrive as just a sympathizer uh, somebody who wants clarification, somebody who wants to, you know, see if they can fit into our dynamic, but also somebody who's just representing a other process, and you want to see if there is some level of connection, you know, or some way that this can be put to the test. We also need that. I mean, if what we do is put to the test every time somebody joins, because you know, if we cannot work around their own or influences in particular context, that says something bad about what we're developing. But it's also put to the test when other organizations kind of interact with us and we get a chance to see if we can make things clearer in that interaction, right, for both sides. So uh, there are many ways to, to approach, I'd say, you know. Am I missing something, guys? I, I, I tried to do like the, the tourist guide. I think it was great. It. Really I think that covers it. I, I was just going to add that you don't really need to come, come in with you know the mindset on contributing you can i think you said that like but just to emphasize that you can just watch and be there while watching and you know uh, it's very welcoming in that sense i mean sometimes the content is not welcoming but, uh, we try to be we we as person <laughs> so if you if you manage to uh, stay perhaps you'll be at some point interested in presenting something so normally this is this is how it goes and uh yeah i will say i actually i mean this might just be like a, a personal neurosis of some kind but i was i find it super refreshing the way in which the content is often not with me that the the part of like the sort of you know online left that i came out of for a while i i kind of was frustrated a little bit with the imperative to like make everything accessible in a certain way. So, what, and like, I feel like that actually prevented a lot of progress on like thinking through problems that it was always sort of bringing back down to like a, the assumed naive other. But being part of a group where it's sort of like, nobody is completely sure of like what a lot of people, <laughs> other people are working on. I actually love this. I think it's, it's very conducive to like every, every interaction that you have, it's an opportunity to learn more about something and the pro through the progress of that interaction, people actually learn things, which I think I think it's a great model, and that's how everyone's doing it. So if you don't know, then that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yes, I was like I was going to comment on something uh, similar that Anna said. I think it's really nice that, um, as Carol said too, uh, it's a safe space <laughs> to not know, and it's a safe space like people are really nice and uh, welcoming. And also at the same time, um, we we don't uh, it's like double down the intellect the interlocutor. I don't say that Interlo interlocutor. I don't know. Yes, exactly. Um, yes. We, don't, we don't dump it down to dump it down. To, I think. Yeah. Yes, dump it down. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. That that's the point. Uh, and I think it's really nice. It's like uh, it has a. You have to engage, and like you, you have to uh, have that. Uh, you have to want to engage. So uh, it's nice that I think if you stay in the group, you will find uh, your entry, and you will find how to develop your theory, and also how to contribute to the group. But uh, you can do it like in your own timing and etc. I think it's a nice way to start, like. And, and just to be the the bearer of a bit of a bad news, there is it's like it's the most normal thing is to be totally like at the first impact you're like fuck, 
the whole is much smarter. It's like we are the materialization as a collective of the fear that someone knows. And there is actually someone that knows, which is like the group as a whole. It's there. It's not, it's not invisible. So it really is something that, at least for me, it's a process. And it's a process that involves humbling yourself a bit, I think, to, to accept and to be, a bit, uh, to be a bit Platonist because I can't help myself. There's a process. There's a, a there's a, a process where you you start to feel okay with this process of not knowing, of asking questions, which is something at least for me. I mean, philosophy grad students, they can be like, the, it's very easy to act as if you're the smartest person in the room, and it's like even if you are not the smartest person in the room, there never is a, a group of a bunch of people, like 20 people, 25 people that are collectively there to be smarter than you. And in STP, you get confronted with that a lot. So it really it really helps, I think, to to also deal with some neurosis neurosis. And and I do think that like it's it's really a humbling experience in general where you actually learn that connecting the pieces it's something that's a process, but the pieces that you connect, they end up being more real. And I think like this is something that, at least for me with STP, is something that I've never had in, in any other place. Hmm. Well, on that note, I will tie this up. I'd like to thank you all for coming here. And I also am extending a, uh, a future session, probably um, when you guys have some time, I, I would, love to have you back on the show um uh, any number of your horde is welcome um no more than eight i can't host more than that they just won't let me but <laughs> um uh but yeah and i i have gotten a lot out of this and i hope my audience does and i will be linking all the stuff you sent me and some stuff i found additionally such as gabriel's re recent article on psychoanalytic militants and a few other things in the show notes um uh, question mark on that psychoanalytic militants appropriately um uh and um so i am glad we had this conversation today and I'm, I'm i'm actually uh i personally feel somewhat vindicated for being an eclectic weirdo so um <laughs> our job here is done <laughs> <laughs> um and uh i would uh even if people don't get involved i would also suggest I actually don't write prose anymore unless I write it collectively because I no longer trust my own judgment um, uh, because I'm an arrogant asshole and, and I know that about myself. And so um, I draft most things collectively. I think it's a good thing for people to, to do because it is necessarily humbling and it also is necessarily a way for you to realize you have to communicate things to other people, not just what you think you know. Um, and, uh, uh, it's a good practice. And so I'm going to end on that endorsement of something that you guys are doing, because I think it is something that is helpful in general. And, um, thank you guys so much, man. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you.